Hi Bowl everyone, I hope you're having a really good day even after school. So today I came across the verse 9.4 and the translation goes as follows. By me and my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. So what I understand from this verse is that Krishna is everywhere around us. He pervades the entire universe. He is in every living entity, humans, animals, plants. He's within us and he's just everywhere. But unlike most people would believe that this makes him an ordinary human being as he, when he comes to the material world, he's automatically conditioned. But this is not true because Krishna remains aloof from all of this. So when we are in the material world, we are constantly conditioned by Maya, by the three modes and by every other living entity too. But when Krishna descends to these planets, he's not conditioned by any of these things and he's able to carry out his transcendental pastime still. And Krishna, it kind of reiterates the point that Krishna is God and no one can refute this argument because no one can claim to be aloof from all of these conditioned aspects in the material world. Only Krishna can be the one to truly be away from this whilst being in it. So this also refutes the idea of the Mayavati philosophy because Krishna also explains how his potent energy is not perceivable by the gross senses that we currently have. So we cannot understand that his unmanifested form can also coincide with his personal form. And this chapter itself is called The Most Confidential Knowledge, which just shows that Krishna is stressing the point that he can be in so many places at once, he can pervade the entire universe whilst remaining within us, and he doesn't need to be conditioned by the aspect of the material world. And I just think in practical terms, we can learn to try and understand that Krishna is everywhere and try and see him in every living entity. We also need to understand that Krishna is able to do all of these things because he is God. And the only way that we can actually find out the truth and get one step closer to understanding Krishna is by practicing Bhakti Yoga, which is recommended in the whole Gita. Thank you. Hi everyone. I hope you've had a good school day. I'm going to be reflecting on text 71 from chapter 2, which goes as follows. A person who has given up all desires for sense gratification, who lives free from desires, who has given up all sense of proprietorship and is devoid of false ego, he can alone attain real peace. What I think this means is our goal is to attempt to give up all materialistic desires and to reorientate your goals so they are aimed at something much more purposeful. For example, when we go to school to study or any form of work such as revision, we would usually do it with the mindset of I'm going to do this for my future, for my career and I thought that this verse was a good reminder that I'd be so much better to switch up our mindset into thinking that we're doing it all for Krishna. The verse also talks about false ego in the instance that we may think simply because we own something or inherit a skill it puts us above others. However, we must continue believing that it all belongs to Krishna, Krishna is helping me do this and it is all contributing to his service and that by doing all of this we can hope to attain a level of true peace. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a good evening. Hi Krishna everyone, so today I turn to the last verse from chapter 12 text 29 that reads as follows. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. Now from this verse, I was enlightened to the luck I had to be a part of Christian consciousness. Our main aim in life should be to fulfill our duty and spread Krishna consciousness. And as Srila Prabhupada said, to give this one life to Krishna. This verse allows me to understand that however much we advance in Krishna consciousness, the easier it is to attain spiritual bliss and the higher probability that we find peace from learning such practices in the Bhagavad Gita. I also learned that the more we engage in Bhakti Yoga, the more distant we become from the chains of the material nature. Additionally, the more we delve into the depths of the Gita, the more we realize the truth, the more we understand the truth, and that allows us to be more connected to Krishna and the world. This allows us to purify our hearts and get the taste of true happiness. If our eyes were not open to Krishna consciousness, how would we be able to overcome barriers and tests such as COVID-19? This is why we should reap the benefits of this chance that we've been given and see our fortune rather than contain ego within ourselves. Thank you.
Hello everyone, hope you're all well and having a great day. Um, for today I picked out verse 49 from chapter 11 and it reads, You have been perturbed and bewildered by seeing this horrible future of mine. Now let it be finished. My devotee, be free again from all disturbances. With a peaceful mind you can now see the form you desire. From this, I can infer that Krishna's universal form, his four-handed form, is something that can terrify even the best of us. If we were ever to see Krishna's universal form, we wouldn't be able to handle it because even Arjuna wasn't able to handle it. So it's showing that even he himself is saying that it is a horrible feature of his and it's a disturbance. So he himself is saying that the universal form is not something that a devotee should worship and rather it should just be his two-handed form. Um, we should worship and devote ourselves to the two-handed form rather than Krishna's universal form because that is something that one should not see for it will terrify him and it's not about how we see Krishna or when we see Krishna if we see Krishna it's just about giving him service and loving him so that we can be free from this cycle of birth and death um, yeah but that's what I got from this and I hope it makes sense <laughs> um, hi well everyone hope you are doing well so today I opened the Gita and I got chapter 4 um, text 1 which reads, The personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna said, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god Vivashvan, and Vivashvan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu in turn instructed it to Ishvaku. Um, so, this, perf um, this text is talking all about Parampara um, and the history of when um, Lord Krishna instructed the transcendental knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita to the Sun God Vibhashvan. Um, but I think like the big point from this verse is all about Parampara and Parampara is that disciplic succession where the principles stay the same but the details change. Like when Srila Prabhupada came to the West and initially he had said that the devotees should chant 64 rounds a day um, but then that's inconvenient. that was inconvenient for them because they had jobs and other stuff. Um, but uh, so Srila Prabhupada then changed it to 16 rounds a day um, and that, that principle of chanting was still there, the, the devotees were still chanting every day um, but that detail of how much they were chanting changed and I feel like Parampara is such an important thing because it's the Bhagavad Gita as it is it hasn't been changed from what Krishna said, it hasn't been interpreted this knowledge has been passed down the Parampara and it hasn't been um, like as such, it's such an important it's so important that we don't mentally speculate on the Bhagavad Gita because then we can misinterpret things and then we can um, come up with I guess foolish um, ideas about what reality is and the truth but here we've been given this transcendental knowledge Lich, um, like Srila Prabhupada has been the representative of Krishna and you know like you hear the previous acharyas say like that it wasn't them that wrote the book it was Krishna writing through them like Krishna told them what to write and they just wrote it down um, so I feel like that's such an important point because it's not that we've been mentally speculating um, on what reality is. This comes straight from Krishna and we're basically being told directly from Krishna. Just um, And in that way, I think that's what this verse is talking about, this point of parampara and um, learning practically straight from Krishna. Hi everyone, everyone. So the verse I came across today was chapter 10, text 10, and it goes as follows. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So what I understand is that Krishna is asking for three things in this verse. The first thing is that we need to be consistent, so always and constantly performing devotional service. 
Secondly, we need to perform devotional service towards him. And the last point is that we need to do good service with love. So if we do these three things, Krishna promises that he will give us the understanding by which we can come to him. This is one of the most important verses in the Bhagavad Gita because this is providing us with the key to go back to Goloka Vrindavan. If you look at the pure devotees of Krishna, like Mother Yashoda, she is constantly do- doing devotional service, such as cooking and taking care of him with love. Srimati Radharani is also always serving him with love. Prarad Maharaj is serving him through remembrance, and this should be our aspiration as a devotee. So while it says that we need to perform devotional services constantly with love, in practical terms it is quite difficult as we have so many distractions such as social media, Netflix and so on, and sometimes we are doing the service in a very mechanical way. So I can say for myself that I have a very long way to go till I reach the full point at which I can follow this verse fully. So basically performing devotional service toward Krishna and with love. Thank you.